So attendees are starting to come in. We'll welcome everybody who's uh, just getting logged on. Hopefully you can hear us. Um, attendees are muted for these meetings until asked to be um, until you're asked to speak. And so um, <clears throat> you just bear with us for a few more minutes. There was approximately 90 people signed up to uh, observe tonight and I see 38 have already logged on. Um, so let's give everybody a few more minutes and see if we can get up to um, around 50. <clears throat> If you have a question at this point, um, I see that Rutilio Martinez is raising their hand. You could write a question in the question and answer thing. Um, the raise hand function will be used when we go to the public comment section. Of the meeting. All right, well, it's 6.02. We have 42 attendees at this point um, signed in, and, and so I'm sure a few more people are going to chime in. Uh, let's go ahead and get started with tonight's oil and gas um, <clears throat> open house regarding the current uh, draft that has been put out by the county. Matt Sura helping us uh, put that together, and, and Frank Haug from our county attorney's office have put a lot of work into this. Um, <clears throat> my name is Matt Lafferty. I'm the principal planner with the Larimer County Community Development Department. And uh, my role here is generally long range planning activities, uh, code rewrites, uh, code amendments, things like that. And that's uh, why we're working on this project is to update where we are with our code on that. Um, there are several other panelists that are joined me tonight. And I'm gonna ask each one of them real briefly just to introduce who they are and how they're affiliated with this project. So. Uh, having done that, I'm going to start top left of my screen. And Jen Cram, would you please introduce yourself? Hi, good evening. I'm Jen Cram, and I'm a planner with Larimer County. I assist Matt with long-range planning efforts as well as current development review. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Leah Snyder. Leah Snyder with the Larimer County Health and Environment Department as environmental health planner. Great. Frank Haug. I'm Frank Haug from the County Attorney's Office. Good. Leslie Ellis? Good evening, everybody. I'm Leslie Ellis. I'm the Community Development Director. Thank you. Lori Catteridge? Good evening, everybody. I'm the Director for Community Planning and Infrastructure Resources, and Community Development is one of the departments within that service area. Thank you, Lori. Matt Sura. Matt Sura, Special Counsel on Oil and Gas Matters for Larimer County. Thank you. Dr. Paul Meyer. Good evening. I'm Paul Meyer, Medical Officer for the Health Department. Very good. So these are our panelists tonight, people that have been working with us throughout the regulate, adoption of these regulations and the preparation of them. So um, the primary team has been primarily uh, Frank Haug and Matt Sura, Leslie Ellis, and myself. Um, but others have helped us um, throughout this process, depending upon their uh, level of expertise in certain situations. Um, <clears throat> tonight's proceedings are going to be pretty simple. Um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have a brief presentation by Matt Sura, which is just to hit some really high points on some of the big changes that went on since we started this, basically things that um, that, that have changed based upon comments made in the public meetings that we've had so far, um, just highlight those. And then we're gonna all be quiet and we're gonna let you guys suggest changes or, or make suggestions on what could be done to improve those things. 
we would hope that your comments would be geared around as much as possible around specific items. Change this to read this way or fix this to include certain language. Um, but we certainly understand that people may have other comments that they want to do. So given the number of people that signed up tonight, we're going to limit everybody's comments to three minutes. We ask that you keep your comments focused and then at about 30 seconds left, I'll let you know that you have 30 seconds left and um, you just wrap up. And if you get down to the last few minutes, if it doesn't sound like you're wrapping up, we will cut you off because we got to stay on, on track tonight. So I'm not trying to be rude um, by doing that at any time. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of the game plan for tonight. What will end up happening is if on the lower uh, part of your screen, if you float your cursor down there, you'll see that you have some things that you can do. There's a question and answer um, section, which you can write stuff in there. We may or may not get a chance to answer any of those questions. If we can, we will. Um, if not, we'll document them and try to respond to them at a later date. Um, there's also a place called Raise Hand. If during this process you want to um, speak, um, when the time comes, just click the raise hand button. It will tell me who comes up in what order, and then that's the order we will take people um, making uh, their comments. So with that, I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to turn it over to Matt Sir, our legal counsel um, consultant, and let him give us a brief presentation on uh, tonight's uh, activities. Matt? Thanks, Matt. I suppose you can see my screen at this point. Great. All right. Well, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is uh, our last open house, uh, June 15th. Just to give you a quick rundown as to the way that we expect uh, the schedule to run for the duration of this code amendment process. Uh, July 21st is going to be a planning commission hearing and July 26 is going to be the board of county commissioners hearing. Uh, just a quick um, outline of the presentation today. I'm just going to give you uh, a quick rundown of the changes that were made since uh, we last visited uh, during a workshop and uh, then we're going to get to public comments. So the majority of the time is going to be public comments tonight. Uh, the special review process um, is still the way that we're framing this uh, oil and gas amendment. Uh, that's the way that it is in current uh, regulations, and we haven't changed that. This is the review criteria that is uh, required right now uh, for any oil and gas application or any special review application under 6.4.2. Uh, however, uh, we looked at uh, in taking public comment and guidance from the Board of County Commissioners. We looked at uh, adding to those and added some special review criteria uh, to really put up front um, that it's not going to negatively impact public health, safety, and welfare, that um, there's not going to have a significant adverse impact, um, or that those impacts are going to be mitigated. Uh, and you can read them for yourself. Uh, we also added some very specific review criteria for public conservation lands. Um, and these are the lands uh, in the county that have conservation uh, that are publicly owned and that they are were purchased um, for conservation, for recreation, um, or for uh, scenic values, uh, wildlife values, et cetera. And so those uh, are going to be protected and there's going to be additional review criteria for those, uh, really expecting that there's going to be a no surface occupancy for those lands, meaning that there's not going to be any surface disturbance on those lands um, unless it meets uh, that it's the only viable alternative and that there's not going to be uh, any net loss in agricultural recreation scenic values. So moving on, um, we also were looking at adding a special administrative review uh, section to the code. And the reason for that is that there are certain oil and gas decisions that didn't raise, didn't rise to the level of needing to have a board of county commissioner hearing and public hearing and, and county commissioner hearing. These are, are issues that uh, are best addressed in an administrative level, still looking at those same criteria, 
um, but uh, doing that at the administrative level. And that's a plugging in abandonment permit. We want to uh, encourage plugging in abandonment. And when that is necessary, we want to make sure that that happens quickly and efficiently. Uh, looking at a seismic survey operations permit, this is typically done through a uh, requirement for a, a permit that they are accessing public roads um, and ensuring that that's done uh, in a way that's not that harmful. And, and certainly more than anything, it's um, noticing the public as to what's going on because there should be, so long as those trucks don't come anywhere near um, public facilities uh, and water wells, those, um, it can be done safely. And that seismic survey is a necessary part of oil and gas development. And then finally, oil and gas pipeline permits. Um, as we've mentioned before, pipelines, particularly oil pipelines, are one of the most important parts of oil and gas development and mitigating the impacts, the long-term impacts of oil and gas development. Uh, there are a lot of siting issues that, that go into um, putting a, a pipeline in place, uh, and those are going to be looked at at an administrative level. Um, and just to, to get a little bit more detail on that, um, we're looking at a, a minimum of 50 feet uh, setback from for pipelines, but recognizing that depending on the pressure of a pipeline, depending on uh, what it's carrying, it could be carrying water, it could be carrying uh, oil, it could be a, a carrying a combination of oil, gas, and water, um, all of those, uh, it's really difficult to be able to designate within uh, the regulations exactly what it might, what a, a appropriate setback would be. And again, that is something that can be done administratively. Looking into uh, siting regulations, we haven't made a, a ton of changes here, uh, except in zoning, we are looking at uh, possibly applying zoning to injection wells and limiting those to industrial zones. There's not that many industrial zones uh, in the county, but uh, an injection well does require typically uh, a lot of truck traffic and it is uh, an industrial operation and, and probably belongs in an industrial zone. Um, moving along to the setbacks, uh, again, this is something that you've seen before and, and something that was discussed in detail by Dr. Richardson, the state toxicologist last time we met, but uh, the majority of the impacts uh, to health or potential impacts to health happen during the, the drilling operations, the completion operations and the flow back. Uh, certainly that is the most industrially intensive um, part of the operations and where you're going to experience the potential for the most nuisance, but also uh, air quality impacts, which is what the modeling in the 2019 risk assessment uh, found. And so taking some of the uh, comments that we heard both from the public and the Board of County Commissioners, we're looking at really breaking down uh, the issue of reverse setbacks into three phases, uh, four phases that is, um, adding one phase. There's the pre-production phase, we're looking at uh, a minimum of a thousand foot uh, setback from oil and gas location until wells are drilled and completed. And I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail as to what an oil and gas location is as opposed to a working pad surface. Uh, early production phase, a minimum of 1,000 feet from the working pad surface uh, for two years after production. And the reason for that is that a majority of the production that occurs during uh, an oil and gas operation is in the first two years. And wanting to make sure that we capture that, that the, the, the most pressure that the oil and gas operation is going to experience is during that first two years and uh, making sure that the operations are, are working as, as expected. Uh, that is going to, that additional assurance during that time and that additional setback, uh, I think is appropriate. So there's an opportunity for surface owners to waive this requirement, um, but there are non waivable requirements as well, including uh, noticing in, in any plats uh, and that there wasn't going to be, if they do waive because they wanna start building, um, there's not gonna be a certificate of occupancy uh, allowed for those buildings unless uh, at the discretion of the director, the planning director. And finally, moving into uh, production phase, 
Uh, this is two years after the oil and gas well has been established. It's running. Um, we're looking at a 200 foot setback from an oil and gas production facility without wells. One to two wells is 200 feet. And again, you can read the three to 24 is 350 and 25 or more wells is 500. And the reason for that, um, well, just wanted to give you quickly, this is a, a working pad. Um, this is a, a, an oil and gas location. The entire entirety of this uh, square is where the drilling and completion operations are. And, and the Connell and Gas Conservation Commission, and now uh, in this code, uh, really look at an oil and gas location as everything that is disturbed by uh, an oil and gas drilling operation uh, and where that drilling is occurring. And then the working pad surfaces after the drilling has occurred and it is into production, that, that pad is supposed to shrink and the interim reclamation is going to take care of all of this area here, um, the working pad surface, and it's gonna shrink probably in, in half or even, even less. Uh, this is a, an example of a 13 acre pad that is gonna shrink down to about four acres uh, once it goes into uh, production. Again, this working pad surface is, is in white and a 350 foot setback from this would look like that. So why do we have um, variations? And this is a, a question that we've received a lot from the public. Um, it's really twofold. One is the industrial nature um, a, a big industrial area such as this um, isn't compatible really with uh, residential use. It's just a different type of use. And there's also um, real practical considerations that, that, you know, a location like this that has 12 wells uh, is going to have more activity. It's just going to be um, more industrial in nature than say a single well pad like this, one of the historic wells out there that, um, and this is you know very typical of a uh, gas well. And you know there is also the potential to pollute uh, is based on the amount of production. The location that you see here uh, with 12 wells is going to have much more capacity to pollute, uh, ability to pollute because it's going to be uh, producing more than, than a location like this. You're also looking at, uh, in this case of 12 wells, you're looking at if there is a, a need to do any uh, maintenance on that, those oil and gas locations, that maintenance activity might take um, you know, several days as opposed to several hours in a, a smaller location. And finally, moving into uh, the post-production phase, uh, the Cullen Gas Conservation Commission recently did this literature review and found that plugged wells generally have negligible or near zero emissions. Um, and that is certainly the case in Colorado. Uh, there are uh, less than a handful, three that um, current Cullen Gas Conservation Commission staff are aware of where they have had problems with uh, a plugged and abandoned well um, once it has been plugged and abandoned and none of those were plugged and abandoned uh, according to the most recent requirements that were adopted in 2018. And that's so three uh, cases of potentially problems with plugging and abandonment out of roughly 40,000 wells that have been plugged and abandoned in the state of Colorado. It's less than one much less than 1%. So looking at the post-production phase, um, we are recognizing in this that we want to make sure that they're plugged and abandoned according to 2018 standards, or that that plugging and abandonment has um, happened and has occurred as it should have, and that there's no potential to emit um, from that oil and gas location. And so we are still maintaining a 200 foot setback unless uh, the landowner asks for an alternative compliance buffer, in which case uh, that landowner has to prove uh, through scientific testing that there's not any water contamination and then there's not any soil contamination or methane coming through this, um, the, the well bore. Uh, we finally have added uh, fines and penalties schedule, um, looking at uh, various amounts of fines between 300 and 15, 
$1,000 uh, for each separate day of violation um, and looking at a number of factors that are partially listed here um, as to what would be the appropriate fine. And that is going to conclude my presentation. Awesome, thank you, thank you Matt, that was great. Um, <clears throat> I think now um, what we're going to do is we're going to move into the second phase of, of tonight's meeting and, and this is where we're going to allow everybody to make a public comment and, and give us your thoughts and whatnot. But before we do, a couple of uh, things that I would like to share with you before we move into that. Um, so I'm going to share my screen uh, real briefly. <clears throat> um, and what I want to show you, um, because not everybody has been on the web page that I know of, but um, can you see my screen now? Thank you. Um, this is our, our web page at larimer.org forward slash planning, as you can see up here in the top left corner. When you, when you type that in and go uh, do a Google search, you're gonna come to this page. A couple of things I want you to note on this page. At the very top here, there are a series of dates and those dates will continue to change. Those are our future public hearing dates for the planning commission, the board of county commissioners and other boards. And so the upcoming meetings in July um, for the oil and gas meetings will show up here um, as they come up. Um, these are not necessarily gonna be virtual meetings. They're probably gonna be in-person meetings. And so um, I'm not sure that we'll have a virtual sign up. Um, but we'll keep you informed on that as best we can. As you page down, there's three boxes here. The middle one, land use code amendments, is the box that you're going to want to click on. If you click on that, it's going to take you to a new screen. And these are our land use code amendments that are currently going on in the uh, Community Development Department. You can see here, we've got a lot of activities going on. One of those is oil and gas regulations. It started in February. We're working through July. These are the anticipated hearing dates for the Planning Commission and the Board of County Commissioners. Um, and this is just a general overview page. Down towards the bottom of the page, you'll see specific items that we're working on. And of course, oil and gas. If you click on that, um, you can come in and you can see that we have a page here that shows the outline of the project, how we've been moving through it. It provides some information up here. For instance, the current public draft version of the regulations as we currently have them um, ready um, is right here. You can look at them. This is a redlined version. So there's gonna be places where we're eliminating text and where we're gonna adding text and that will be outlined in red. Um, if it gets hard to read that, you can always go down to this other one that says clean version and it won't have those red lines and it. it'll look like just regular text um, without all the strike throughs and whatnot. <clears throat> Article 2.94 is also a part of the code that's getting changed because it deals with setbacks, reverse setbacks, and some of those types of things. So you'll want to look at that. Um, so I wanted to point to this because that's really important where you will find current information on the proposed regulations. This big top line here that I'm running my cursor across right now, if you want to make a written comment to us because three minutes isn't enough time to make comments tonight, all you need to do is click on that. It's going to pull up a page. You can make public comment right there. Um, it'll probably limit how much you can make a comment. And so if your comments get rather lengthy, what you will want to do is you'll just want to pipe me an email at mlafferty at larimer.org. Send me an email. I'll make sure that it gets to the team as well as ultimately gets put in the packet to the Planning Commission and the Board of County Commissioners. According to this timeline, any comments that we received before this end date of this review of the, of the current draft, the consolidated public draft, which will end on 20, June 28th, anything that's received up to that point, we will read them and um, we will take into consideration what is said and they may influence changes in, in this draft that's going to come out on July 9th. July 9th. Um, that's not to say that you make a comment that that absolutely means the code's going to change. That just means that we'll consider it. Um, 
On July 9th, we will post what we call the public hearing draft. This public hearing draft will be the draft that our planning commission um, is presented with uh, from what we're gonna do. And included in that will be all the comments we received from everybody um, and any additional information that we think is necessary for the planning commission to see. And so there will be a time gap in here in which uh, you can prepare your comments that you can make in person at the July 21st meeting to the Planning Commission. So you can show up and say, hey, I, I object to the regulations from this area or this point, but for the rest of it, I like it. Um, you can make specific comments there and the Planning Commission will weigh that in their testimony that night and make a decision about that. And then again, on July 26th, we'll have a similar hearing with the Board of County Commissioners and that should be about the time we um, seek adoption. <clears throat> so um, just wanted to point out this information. This is all here for you to look at. There's other supplemental information you can see um, down here, the bottom of the page. There's a whole variety of things that you can do. If you missed a meeting and you wanna go back and look at them, um, we've got work session videos um, from the work sessions with our planning commission and BCC. We have uh, public outreach videos um, from meeting with all of you. Um, if you want to go back and review any of those, they're there for you to see. Um, so I wanted to share that information. Uh, I wanted you to know there's a variety of ways to make comments to us. You can drop off your written comments if you think that's necessary. That's great. We want you to make very specific comments that are very um, organized towards what we're wanting to do. And we want to hear what you all have to say before we get the final draft uh, submitted to the planning commission. So thanks for hearing me out on that. And with that, <clears throat> I'm going to ask if there's anyone, I'm going to go to the top of my page that wants to speak, please feel free to raise your hand and we will unmute you and you'll be able to speak. I'm going to start with Rutilio Martinez. You are now allowed to speak, followed by Ray Martinez and then Deb Bajor. Okay, I thank you for this opportunity and for your valuable work. My name is Rutilio Martinez. I'm a PhD in economics from Vanderbilt University. I'm a retired professor of uh, quantitative methods from the University of Northern Colorado, uh, where I taught for 26 years. According to the San Luis branch of the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, at the national level, the oil and gas industry generates 100, or generated 197,000 jobs in 2014. That was the maximum number of jobs generated by the, this industry in the last 26 years. In 2019, the year before the pandemic, that number had declined to 143,000 jobs at the national level. By 2020, the job had continued to decline and stood at 136,000. These numbers imply that Colorado cannot be uh, or the Colorado, uh, Colorado's oil and gas industry cannot be a major employer in the state. Uh, since Colorado's oil uh, industry generates four or 5% of the output of the oil industry in the entire country. Now, the beauty of labor statistics has figures that support this perspective. According to this bureau, the sector denominated mining and logging which includes all extraction activities, generated 19,200 jobs in 2020. That means oil and gas had to have generated a lot less than 19,000 jobs. This is to say that Colorado oil and gas could not have employed more than 0.5% of Colorado's labor force. Now, the marginal contribution of oil and gas to employment in Colorado, oil and gas extraction, will continue for at least three facts. First, the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis has reported that the fracking industry is loaded with $46 billion in debt. Second, the same institution has reported the fracking industry has yet to produce positive cash flows. And third, of the 10 largest economic sectors of the economy of Colorado, oil and gas extraction and, no, is the smallest one. 
So cannot be that important. Therefore, it would be a serious mistake to consider the regulations that protect the health of Coloradoans uh, as more important, uh, you, know, you know, consider these regulations and as yeah, not as is, you know, Okay, well, these figures say that uh, the generation of jobs is not that important. The laws that protect the jobs, the laws that protect health are far more important. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. We appreciate your comments. <clears throat> uh, Ray Martinez, followed by Deb Bjork, and then Lori Brunswick. Ray, you are now allowed to speak, sir. Okay, I, and I assume you can hear me. Yes, sir, we can. Okay. I want to zoom out a little bit more from what was just said. Uh, this industry of the oil and gas industry really has a trickle down effect of about a 60 to $80 billion industry in Colorado. And that really impacts the mom and pop shops. 80% of businesses in Colorado and Fort Collins are small business people. Consequently, small business is big business in Colorado. This can have an impact on our sales tax revenue if the mom and pop shops close. We've already seen that during the pandemic, this compounds the existing problem. For me, this is more encompassing problem for minority owned businesses and minorities that are trying to stay employed. Your intentions may be good, but the outcome is a double negative if it ends up shutting down businesses. In December, 2020, the director of the minority business office for the state said that there is approximately 130,000 to 150,000 minority owned businesses in Colorado. That represents 21% of all Colorado firms. Overall, the COVID-19 relief small business fund that was allocated and the bill was passed for $37 million. Of that 37 million, only 4 million goes to minority owned businesses. That doesn't go very far. And it's a really just a temporary shot in the arm for these folks. Shutting the doors on the oil and gas industry in a, in a polite way, that's what's happening will only make it harder to really keep the doors open for the minority owned businesses. In fact, it will shut the doors permanently for many, which it happened during the pandemic. So the trickle down effect is really more detrimental than most of us realize. If you support small businesses and minorities in Colorado, then I really think the commissioners need to be more sensitive to the hardworking people of Colorado that are the backbone of our economy. Overregulating matters doesn't pass the test of equity for all. And I'm disappointed that the commissioners are not at this hearing. I know you're saying it's more administrative, but this really needs to be heard by the commissioners and not just note taking and passing notes on. I'm hoping that this recorded message is going to be sent to the commissioners for them to listen to. And I encourage them to listen to what the people are saying. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. And uh, just for your edification, um, Commissioner Shattuck McNally is on. I haven't seen the other two at this point, but uh, they'll probably log on a little later in the process. And these are recorded, so we do pass this information on to our, our board. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Okay, Deb Bajork, you're now allowed to talk, followed by Lori Brunswick and then Richard Mulhern. Deb? Thank you, Deb York. I'm a 30 year resident. Thank you for this opportunity. I would just point out we only have a little over 300 uh, oil wells in Colorado, or in, excuse me, Larimer County. So we don't have a huge contingent of jobs here for that. The BOCC has asked that denial authority be clearly stated, yet the purpose sections in the current draft erode protections with words like minimizing health and environmental impacts and words that suggest the least harmful site for a new oil and gas facility will be acceptable. The county regulations are being revised to bring them up to the floor of the state regulations, so they should be. State regulations explicitly state that approval is only allowed under protective conditions, can deny if an application does not meet with the act, and says local governments who regulate siting of oil and gas can deny the siting of a proposed oil and gas facility. This should be clearly stated. Zoning. In this draft, oil and gas facilities can be located with numerous zoning districts without obtaining a variance. 
oil and gas facilities should only be allowed in industrial zones. No variants or waivers should be allowed for residential zones. The BOCC does not want oil and gas facilities near neighborhood schools, waterways, natural areas. Oil and gas development belongs only in zone, area zone for industrial activity. Zoning and setback distances are necessary to protect residents. Health impacts are substantial out to 2,500 feet. Open zones put oil and gas next to homes and contaminate our scenic views. Acres of trees will be cleared in forest zones counter to our climate smart plan. Fracked open county space and school trust lands will be outrageous to track taxpayers. In the draft, class two water disposal wells can be located in heavy industrial zones. They should not be allowed. The landfills in Lermer County are zoned heavy industrial use. The current landfill has large county psychiatric treatment facilities slated to be built. Are we going to allow class two disposal wells next to that facility? The new landfill is an area with numerous ranchettes. Do they know that, that injection wells could be placed close to their homes, land and animals? Leaks and seismic activities are risks with injection wells. Reverse setbacks. The current draft allows homes, schools, hospitals, et cetera, to be built 100 feet from an oil and gas facility during pre and early production stages. After two years of production, homes and schools can be built only 350 feet from an existing oil and gas facility with up to 24 wells and 500 feet from wells with 25 or more wells. This is egregious. Until a well is properly plugged and abandoned and reclamation is completed, the reverse setback should be at least 2,000 feet without exceptions. The health impacts, okay, the health impacts to nearby residents are the same if a school is built first or if a fracking wall is built first. A 100-foot reverse setback should be the minimum for plugged and abandoned. The current draft reads that oil and gas facilities will be 2,000 feet from the property lines of schools. This should be 2,500 feet, including long-term care facilities. The draft states that a minimum setback of 1,000 foot from occupied buildings. Setback should be at least 2,500 feet unless there's variance. No oil and gas facilities should be closer than 2,000 feet from any home or high occupancy building. No oil and gas facilities should be allowed in 100-year floodplains. This should be struck from the regulations. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Deb. Okay, uh, Lori Brunswick, followed by Richard Mulhern, and then Karen Artell, and then Matt Bunker. Lori, your floor is yours. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Lori Brunswick, and I've lived in Larimer County for, since uh, 1980. And I, I can't even believe it's been 41 years. So I, I really appreciate so much of your time that you've worked on this and it, it, it's improving and I really appreciate that. But uh, over this period of a couple of months, I've talked to the commissioners, one about disproportionately impacted communities. I wonder, is there anything in your regulations that even mention that? I, I don't know. Ray Martinez, you know, he, he decided to grace our, our uh, presence here with his comments about minorities and how they be impacted without oil and gas. And I'm saying right now, Ray, we are impacting, disproportionately impacting communities right now that are minorities. So because of oil and gas, because Prospect Energy is in the middle of one of those areas. Um, I wanna talk about the underground injection control and that it should only be, only be located in industrial area zones. Um, I think that it's already, uh, Reg 42 should be an entirely zoned industrial because that area, anybody can plant their little particles and then they can right there next to a home. And I was just out there today, beautiful homes out there, not expecting that kind of thing. I think that a whole 42 regulation, 42 areas should be considered industrial, unless you want to make those zone, that huge area smaller and little bubbles. I don't see how you're gonna get around doing that. So, um, and then the seismic operations. That should never impact wildlife and nesting uh, songbirds, uh, golden and bald eagles live out there where northern or uh, uh, Wellington 
waterworks is, that's all protected areas per COGCC web, uh, website mapping. If you look out there, it's all there. It, those are beautiful lakes out there. Why are we impacting that? Uh, 30 seconds. Okay, if seismic activity bothers birds, they will uh, fly away and they're not gonna nest. We're gonna lose our large pockets of burrowing owls that live out there. And there's also bald and golden eagles out there that we need to make sure they are protected. And that's it, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Lori. Um, I would ask uh, everybody in, in the sense of being respectful that we don't call out other people's names and, and rely on their comments. Respect everybody's comments. Everybody has an opinion, so let's not call each other out on this. <clears throat> Richard Mulhern, you're allowed to speak. Karen Artell is on deck, and then Matt Blanco. Hi, my name is Richard Mulhern. I live at 131 Stanley Circle Drive in Estes Park, Colorado. I've been an independent businessman here. I have four vacation rentals. Um, SB 181, which passed in 2019, created the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservative Conservation Commission, which focused on public health rights while completely neglecting personal property rights. My concern for the restrictions that you're putting is the liability that may be set on me as a Larimer County resident. And this is due to the court ruling of Nick versus Township of Scott in October 2018, which allow, basically allows mineral right owners to recover property values of which they have been deprived. And this is due to the violation of the Fifth Amendment taking clause. And in the Fifth Amendment, it says, a citizen shall not be deprived of life, liberty, and property without due process of the law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. And what this basically did was overturn Williamson County versus Hamilton Bank, which basically required property owners to exhaust state courts uh, remedies before taking a federal taking clause to a federal uh, court. Uh, when, when Chief Justice uh, gave his opinion, he said the likelihood that a plaintiff would bring a state court claim, lose, and therefore be uh, precluded from bringing a claim in a federal court is what he was concerned about. So basically, mineral rights can be uh, avert, a person that owns mineral rights can avert the state courts and go directly to federal court, which costs a lot of money. But um, the reason I bring this all up is that I am a mineral rights owner, not in Larimer County, but in Weld County. And uh, for many years, uh, we were given offers to buy the mineral rights for about $1,200 an acre, uh, maybe you got as high as 15, and then I didn't hear anything for many years. And then um, I started getting weekly calls to buy our mineral rights after uh, just in the last five months. Um, when, I had the, when I spoke at the May 18th meeting, I had been, received an offer for $4,800 an acre, which seemed amazing to me. And then yesterday, I got an offer for $6,000 per acre. Um, and this is interesting to me. It seems like people who would not be buying mineral rights, but I found out these are investors that are speculating. And they may be speculating on this, taking this to court and using this taking clause, taking it to federal court. And then all of a sudden we would be liable, not only be, because we're putting extra restrictions beyond what the state is Seconds. putting. And so, you know, uh, with all that being said, I want to just warn us that we need to be, be careful of being pulled into a lawsuit. And I am going to call out a name. I'm going to call out Jody Shattuck McNally for being here. I appreciate you putting, putting that on there. I met with uh, Senator Rob Woodward on Friday with a group of people. He sat there and listened to our concerns. And I appreciate you being here and listening to our concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Okay, Karen Artell, followed by Matt Blanco, and then Representative Andrew, and I'm sorry, my screen isn't showing me the whole name, Andrew Bozen, Bozenecker. Can I just, can I just ask first, is this, do we have two minutes or three minutes? <laughs> you have three minutes. Three minutes, okay. 
Okay, my name is Karen Arto. I live in Larimer County. Thank you all for your efforts in updating the county's oil and gas regulations. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go through just uh, sections quickly uh, because of the time limit. So forgive me for that. So notice the home buyers must include current oil and gas facilities, the location of permitted but not yet built or drilled oil and gas locations, shut in and temporarily abandoned wells, flow lines, scattering lines, and pipelines. Reverse setbacks should be the same as setbacks for new facilities. Reverse setbacks from plugged and abandoned wells must be able to accommodate potential future repair or uh, repeat plugging. For air quality, stopping high frequency or continuous emissions monitoring at two years after the last well has entered production without a more robust leak and detection repair program exposes county residents to health risks of pollution in the surrounding area, higher pollution levels during wintertime inversions, and high ozone day days during the summer. Emissions from tanks and pipelines must also be accounted for. Leak detection and repair should be conducted more frequently than annually. And I agree that only modern leak detection technology, technologies and equipment be used. Um, transparency. I agree that notifications to surrounding areas of oil and gas activity should be provided, but really all notifications should be available to the public from both the COGCC and the operator by posting on a county hosted website with opt in email or text messaging. Boulder air is an important piece of the puzzle for improving air quality, since air emissions data is posted in real time online for public asset, as, access at any time. So I, uh, you'll see, I sent you some written comments and you'll see that I'm confused about uh, oil and gas facilities and injection wells in heavy industrial areas. I looked at the, your, the county's um, uh, land use code adopted in March and it looked like according to the uh, um, county code that heavy industrial areas are part of urban zoning districts. Um, which, and urban zoning districts do um, include residential uh, housing. So anyway, you'll forgive me if I don't quite understand um, what the code is, but um, I am concerned that the heaviest of industrial uses of oil and gas uh, facilities and injection wells would be near residential areas if in um, heavy industrial areas. Um, I would, so that's a concern I have. Um, and I also think that new injection wells should be banned from Larimer County. Um, and please see my written comments for more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Arto. <clears throat> okay, Matt Blanco, followed by Representative Andrew Bosneckner, and then Brad Tidd. Uh, Matt, you're now free to speak. You need to unmute yourself. Thank you. My name is Matthew Blanco. I am a resident of Larimer County and have been all my life, as so have the last three generations of my family. <clears throat> they have put their blood, sweat, tears into building this community to what it is. Uh, it is almost completely offensive to me and I guess my family as well that we are having people who have not lived here not even a decade trying to dictate and change the rules and regulations that have already been set forth long before they had even moved here um, not even 10 years ago is I think what I guess uh, what I've <laughs> pictured on a few of the last uh, meetings that I have attended is I think 15 was the most, and that was one person that is against these regulations. And I find that completely offensive as uh, a fourth generation resident who lives, works, and raises children here as well. So the fifth generation of my family is now here. Um, oil and gas companies at this moment still, uh, or at this moment, they do meet and exceed the current regulations as they are set forth. I believe it was brought up before that this has uh, the regulations have been um, amended back two years ago, if not even a year ago. And so now we're redoing it again. Was it not planned for future uh, 
future drilling and, and dr injection sites? Was that not part of the plan there? I don't know. I wasn't at the tending of, of those. Um, to the fact of uh, those saying that it affects everybody around you, I would like to point out Gutterson Ranch in Weld County, a rather large working ranch out there is where a lot of our beef comes from that we all love so much, that Colorado beef. And it has many wells and working production pads on it. I believe none of us have gotten sick from any of that. So um, health benefits or health um, health regulations on that particular um, example is not necessarily needed far uh, more than what they already are currently. Now, uh, something something that got brought up um, pre previously was transitional job placement. I would like mm -hmm. to see anything if that is going to be something that happens because as an oil and gas worker, I am an x-ray technician that inspects welds before they even go into production. Um, who would be paying for this? And where would it be available? Is it going to be at the cost of the county? So more of my tax dollars that I'm not making for being jobless is gonna go to this. I, I, I would like to see some, something more on that. Thank you for your comments, Neil. Yes. Okay, uh, Representative Andrew Bosnecker. Brad Tidd, and then Andrew Forks Goodmanson. Representative Andrew, you're free to speak. Thank you, Matt, uh, and good evening. My name is Andrew Basenecker, and I serve as the state representative for House District 53, representing the west half of Fort Collins in the state legislature. I'm grateful for the opportunity to raise up a few key concerns related to the oil and gas regulations here in Larimer County. Many thanks for all the hard work that has gone into this process so far. I regularly hear from residents of Fort Collins though, who have deep and real concerns about the quality of our air, water and soil here in Larimer County as a result of oil and gas development. At the state level and from the first day of session to the very last, providing critical and reasonable protections for residents and ecosystems remains a top priority. In particular, I would like to address the concerns around air quality here in Larimer County. I, alongside numerous constituents, strongly feel that Larimer County needs more robust and accurate air quality monitoring that is capable of identifying and measuring emissions from oil and gas operations that impact local areas and regional air quality. Fort Collins remains part of the non-attainment region spanning the front range. Monitoring and reporting must be in real time to identify excessive and dangerous emissions and to enable rapid response when such emissions occur. The county has a critical role to play in protecting the health and well being of its residents, which is why, in addition to continuous monitor monitoring that is paid for by industry and conducted by an independent third party expert, the county should also be empowered to investigate possible violations and complaints quickly. And if a violation has occurred, take enforcement actions, including a penalty sufficient to deter future violations. An additional concern I would like to address is related to setbacks. At the state legislature, we have been focused on ensuring that disproportionately impacted and underrepresented communities enjoy the same protections and quality of life as other communities. I would urge the same focus and intentionality here in this plan and in Larimer County. Putting the health of communities first, naming communities that have been disproportionately impacted and looking forward to an energy future that will be increasingly reliant on renewable energy resources. Larimer County should adopt setbacks and reverse setbacks that truly protect public health and safety, including 2,500 foot setbacks, including reverse setbacks for all occupied buildings and recreation areas, including parks and open space conservation areas, unless a variance is allowed to a 2,000 foot minimum setback with no exceptions for oil and gas sites and facilities. We shall also adopt 2,500 foot setbacks for schools, playgrounds, and care facilities and residential areas designed for older adults with no exceptions for operational oil and gas sites and facilities, as well as 1,000 foot minimum setbacks from any pl properly plugged and abandoned well. Five seconds. I believe that these protections would align regulations in Larimer County with a large body of medical and scientific evidence, evidence that supports a 2,500 foot distance between oil and gas sites and places where people live, work, and recreate in order to provide pr a protection of public health and safety. If we want to discuss equity and talk about that in depth, this has to be factored in. Thank you for your time and for your help in protecting our residents and ecosystems here in Larimer County for generations to come. Thank you for your time, sir.
in your comments. Okay, let's see. We have Brad Tidd, followed by Andrew Forks Goodmanson, and then Anson Perino. Thank you for this opportunity to comment. Um, I've been a resident since 1993 in Larimer County. I also uh, am a landowner. Uh, besides my residence um, with investment properties and uh, and all kinds of uh, injection of uh, funds into the county and tax base and just people and and hiring people so um it it saddens me that we are so aggressively trying to hurt an industry which gives people a great opportunity to make uh, uh, a good very good living um uh, we need to try and have the return on investment for any of these <clears throat> restrictions. We have to be able to show what it is we get out of them. It can't just be a good feeling. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. It has to be. Uh, it has to be physical, economic, health. Um, I've I've heard quite a few things cited that. Um, I, I, I'm dubious on. Um, I know that there are a great many jobs that account for this, and you know the taking of uh, of mineral rights, the use of mineral rights, the use of land uh, is is something we don't want to do. Um, I have a personal friend who became a multimillionaire when LAX put in a third runway and went over people's houses and he had a clash lasting lawsuit for the taking of their property value although they never actually took anything directly from people this could be just like that and could cost larimer county hundreds of millions quite literally so i really wouldn't want us to get into that um, if we match the state on regulations that seems quite reasonable um, if we exceed them, that does not seem reasonable. I don't want to waste the county's money um, and, and, and my money, frankly, uh, regulating things that are already regulated. Um, 30 seconds. And uh, I, I would like to cut down on the redundancy uh, that we are trying to impose on industries there is a cost to that. Um, costs to businesses are always passed on and we need to avoid that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Okay, Andrew Forks Goodmanson, followed by Anson Perina, and then Corey Carroll. Andrew? Good evening. Um, Thank you for uh, hosting this meeting and for the opportunity to provide public comment tonight. I apologize for the background noise. I thought my washing machine would be done before my time came up, um, but I was off by six minutes, so sorry. Um, so I wanted to start by um, taking perhaps a different tact than you might have expected and thanking you for the work that has gone into these regulations. I know that Logic, um, sorry, my name is Andrew Forkus Goodmanson, I'm the Deputy Director of Logic, um, and my organization has spent a lot of time submitting uh, comments on these regulations. Uh, we've submitted, you know, maybe 30 or 40 pages of comments, and it's called out a lot of areas where I think there needs to be improvement, and I wanted to take a moment today to thank you for responding to those comments in part and for the work that has gone into these regulations generally. Um, for example, I think the leak detection and repair program has been uh, developed quite well, as well as the air monitoring and the odor program. I think those bits of the regulations do sort of exactly what SB 181 intended. They look at the state standard and the Larimer County needs and tailor regulations specifically to Larimer County's needs in a pretty good way. We're planning on offering some brief suggestions for what we think are pretty minor improvements in those sections, but in general, I think those sections are, are what we want from these regulations, good, thoughtful regulations that are tailored for Larimer County's needs. 
unfortunately it's not all good and i think there are sections that um remain far too um deferential maybe for lack of a better word um and are not appropriately prioritizing public health safety welfare the environment and wildlife resources as required by sb 181. Um, for example, in the presentation this evening, we heard about the no surface occupancy and conservation lands, which is great until you get to the unless. And people always say nothing said before the word but means anything. And I think in uh, regulation writing, you might want to change that to nothing said before unless means a whole lot. And so I call out that example specifically, but you see that language all throughout the regulations. For example, in the 100 year floodplain, we say that no wells will be located in the floodplain unless it's the only feasible location. We don't have to worry about the only feasible location. 181 gave Larimer County the clear authority to deny harmful regulations. And if a location is harmful, it's harmful, even if it's the only place that those minerals can be accessed. And I would encourage striking all of that just straight away. Um, you, we don't need to defer and we don't need to provide a location if the location is not uh, uh, protective. Um, I have a lot to say about reverse setbacks, um, which you'll see in writing. Um, and I want to take a brief moment to say something about zoning requirements as well. 10 seconds. 10 seconds. I'll say it really fast. Zoning is an important first brush tool and the um, compatibility analysis in a change of zoning requirement is an important tool and by allowing oil and gas in many zones, you preclude the use of that tool. And sorry, I went like five seconds over. Thank you, sir, uh, for your comments tonight. <clears throat> okay, Anson Perina, Car Corey Carroll, and then Rick Casey. Anson, you can unmute yourself. I'm, now you are. Am I on? Yes. yes, sir, you are. Okay. My name is Anton Perina. I've lived in Latimer County for over four, uh, 50 years. My comments tonight are empirical and anecdotal, not statistical or technological. I used to be a logger and stormwater. <clears throat> in the late 80s, I was on the committee to rewrite the Forest Service plan for the Arapaho Roosevelt Forest. Despite the logging industry's input into the Forest Service uh, policies, the Forest Service restricted the allowable cut of trees to such a low level that I had to quit the forest products industry. It was strangulation through regulation. The Forest Service wanted to save trees, but last year the forest fires destroyed the trees anyway. 30 years ago, I lost my business and the state lost revenue and Larimer County lost 25 jobs to other states and to Canada. Now, <clears throat> Larimer County wants to get rid of the oil and gas industry. Anti-fracking laws and other laws have again affected my family. My son and many close good friends have had to find other work. Again, we will lose good paying jobs and revenue to other states and offshore countries, but we will not lessen the consumption of carbon fuels. Keep this industry in Carbon County. Don't strangle the industry with over-regulations. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, Corey Carroll. Rick Casey, Ted Wacom. Great. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Yes. Excellent. I'll start my timer, so I'll try to follow this. I am uh, Corey Carroll. I'm a family physician in Fort Collins. I've been here about 30 years. Before that, I was a student at CSU. Uh, first off, disclosures. I am an ind independent family practice physician in Fort Collins. I don't get paid by any industry. I don't work for any industry other than for myself. And my concern is the health of my patients and all the citizens of basically Colorado. Um, I'm not interested in keeping the status quo at the risk of hurting my patients. So a couple of things I wanna focus on. And first is trust. Uh, question, do I trust all my patients to tell me the truth? You know, no. Do I trust the uh, pharmaceutical industry to give me uh, safe and effective drugs, sometimes, but sometimes not. 
Uh, there was a president we used to have, Ronald Reagan, who said, trust but verify. I recognize that individuals and corporations will not admit behaviors that do not uh, follow what we think they should be doing. And that doesn't make them evil, that just makes them human. We don't have enough data to truly understand what damage is being done, but we have a lot. I was at the Larimer County Board of Commissioners meeting this morning. There was video shown from flare cameras from a storage facility about a quarter mile. That is 1,640 feet from a patient of mine. And he was being exposed to volatile organic compounds that were coming from the top. He experienced headaches, nosebleeds, uh, feeling nauseated. Two other, they called the industry that came out and quote repaired it, they checked it again. It was still leaking, they repaired it. Fortunately, it seems like it's now repaired, but it took somebody to go out there and look at it before anything happened. So we need to have this information. I also introduced uh, the seventh uh, compendium of scientific and medical and media findings that is talking in uh, the framework of medical uh, uh, peer reviewed data of damage. We're talking congenital malformations, uh, damages to people with asthma, heart disease. This is a very thick document that has a great amount of information. I would be happy to forward that to anybody. I gave the county commissioners some, some information on that. The last thing I'll try to get quickly in the last 40 seconds is economics. We talk about, oh, uh, this is going to destroy our economy. Why are we afraid to move to a new economy? We have jobs that could be open to people in a healthier, cleaner environment, which would actually give them a good income and not expose them to disease. So lastly, the precautionary principle emphasizes caution, pausing, and review before leaping into new innovations that may prove disastrous. At a minimum, we have to have more data. We need continuous monitoring by unbiased sources that give us information that can tell us how to protect our citizens. I thank you for listening to me and thank you for the work you're doing. Very timely. <laughs> Thanks for your comments, sir. Uh, Rick Casey, Ted Walkup, and Nancy York. Uh, Rick, you are now free to speak. Okay, great. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir, we can. All right. Well, good evening, and thank you for letting me speak tonight. I am Rick Casey, a Fort Collins resident since 2018, and I've been a Colorado resident since 1981. I have taught environmental economics at Front Range Community College for over 10 years, and I've been involved in environmental activism in the Front Range since 2012. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the Fort Collins Sustainability Group. The FCSG has been engaged in environmental issues with the county and the city since around 2009. The Fort Collins Sustainability Group would like to express its support for the nonprofit Larimer Alliance and their comments about the proposed oil and gas regulations for Larimer County. I believe they have forwarded those four pages of comments to you. We believe their research into and statements about the inadequacy of the proposed regulations should be taken seriously. Please examine carefully their detailed and pointed suggestions about air quality, water quality, health impacts, wildlife and habitat, and permanent degradation of soil and vegetation. SB 181 was intended to empower local agencies, such as the county commissioners, to enact meaningful regulations, improving the proposed regulations by addressing the suggestions made by the Larimer Alliance will be fulfilling the intent of the law. We hope the commissioners will act accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, let's see. Ted Walkup, Nancy York, and then Ed Behan. Um, Ted, you are now allowed to unmute yourself and speak. Thank you. I'm Ted Walkup. I live in West Fort Collins. Oil and gas regulations should stringently protect health, safety, wildlife, and the environment in our county. A number of organizations, including the Larimer Alliance for Health, Safety, and the Environment, LOGIC, the League of Oil and Gas Impacted Coloradans, the Sierra Club, and Colorado Rising have empirical, science-based information 
readily available that the Board of Commissioners and the Planning Commission should follow in drafting its revised regulations. Strict regulation is necessary because oil and gas companies need to be responsible stakeholders. They should not, in, under any circumstances, come into the county, take their profits, and pull out, leaving behind desolate, polluted sites and unplugged wells for taxpayers to clean up. Without this type of regulation, Larimer County's water quality and supply will continue to be compromised. Wastewater from oil and gas is disposed of in the northern part of the county through underground injection and through dumping in the Box Elder Creek alluvial. As for supply, anywhere between 1.5 million and 16 million gallons of water may be used to frack a single well, according to the US Geological Survey. This waste of an already scarce resource is not what we want in our county. Also, we have already serious life-threatening problems with the air we breathe. You can see it in the air quality alerts from the National Weather Service over the last few days. And you can see it in the F grade Larimer County has received from the American Lung Association. These problems are attributable in large part to fracking operations in Well County. It makes you wonder why should we even be thinking about allowing increased oil and gas operations in our county. Other speakers tonight have commented on and will comment on additional factors, maybe even climate change, that should bring about enforceable revised regulations for oil and gas facilities. But I'm asking that you consider our residents' health and safety and the protection of the environment and wildlife mm -hmm. as the overriding concern in your deliberations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Okay, we have uh, Nancy York followed by Ed Behan and then Jim Rain. Nancy, you're free to speak. Good evening. Uh, I'm so glad I could unmute. Um, mm -hmm. My name is Nancy York. I'm um, born and raised in Fort Collins. Uh, I've been here for over 80 years. I uh, served on the Fort Collins Air Quality Advisory Board for a good number of years, and air quality is a particular issue uh, of concern for me. Um, particularly the, the, the health issues related to air pollution. And my other major concern is climate, the climate crisis which also threatens life that and uh, but may re also result in nearly an uninhabitable pla planet with food shortages and ex extinctions and deadly high temperatures with more death. Uh, I gravitate towards any study that it talks about air quality and a recent one, which is 2019, found that, that 200,000 people die in the United States as a result of air pollution. And I would be happy to send any of these studies to you. The federal government uh, continues to repeatedly drop the level of concern for ozone because of uh, medical research that finds it more dangerous than the, the previous one. This is also true regarding the air, air emissions from uh, oil and gas development. And it has to be pointed out that the literature says that the emissions from oil and gas development is greater than what, what has been reported. Thus, we need more, more monitoring, air quality monitoring. Uh, so, you know, another study has said that they studied uh, military v uh, veterans and they found nine causes of death 
with air as a, a result of air pollution, cardiovascular disease. Three, three seconds. Thirty. Thirty seconds. Oh my goodness. Well, the bottom line, the international community internationally, it's known that we should eliminate fossil fuels as a result of the climate emergency, and there is uh, so that you should take that into consideration of your regulations and oil and gas workers will be will be changed so that they will have good jobs well earned jobs cuz we are going to change uh, change our society uh, with the green new deal thank, thank you Ms. thank you very much thank you for your work and good evening thank you Okay, Ed Behan, Jim Rain, and then Doug Henderson, or Henderson. Um, before we I unmute Ed, uh, Doug uh, was given, asked this afternoon if he could present uh, two short videos um, as part of his verbal comments. And uh, so we will be allowing him to show those. So Doug, could you please have your videos ready to go when I unmute you, please? Thank you. Ed, the floor is yours. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ed Bean, and I am a resident of Fort Collins. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you during this session and for your continued work revising Larimer County's oil and gas regulations. <clears throat> I am repeating information I have previously shared with you all by email, but I want these remarks to be part of the public record. I know as one of the spokespeople for the Larimer Alliance, I have repeatedly raised concerns about air quality in the context of the pending revision of the county's oil and gas regulations. I know that regional monitoring technology is not necessarily something that would be established by regulation in the land use code, although that remains a critical issue to be addressed, if for no other reason than we are downwind from Weld County. But the issue of monitoring on the individual well pads and other facilities is something that is being considered in the draft regulations. I know that canister monitoring systems have been designated as required in the revised air quality segment of the rules. One concern is those canister systems may monitor continually, but their intake is only checked periodically, a period of a week or once a month. The problem with that sort of system is that something that needs to be dealt with may be happening, but unless crew happens to be on site, it may not be caught. This could include leaks that affect air quality or something possibly indicative of a potential catastrophic failure. I was recently made aware of a Colorado-based company named Project Canary. They provide technology and systems for continuous air quality monitoring with fence line sensors that are connected to a network so alarms might be received and responded to 24 seven. One would think this would be in the interest of the operator as well as the first responders who may have to come online in the event of any serious failure. This company apparently works with a range of energy developers, utilities and regulatory entities. I will place a link in the question section of tonight's Zoom to the YouTube video of a presentation of an air quality symposium at the University of California, Davis by a co-founder of Project Canary. If I am understanding her discussion correctly, the company has also worked in conjunction with CSU and the CDPHE. I will include a link to the company's website as well. I am not suggesting this is the only technology of this type available, but it is the first serious leap I have seen for site-specific monitors beyond the periodically checked canister systems. I hope you all will make appropriate inquiries and consider this as a standard for required monitoring by oil and gas developers operating in Larimer County. Thank you for your continued dedicated work on the county's oil and gas regulations and for your attention in this matter. Thank you, sir. Okay, it looks like uh, Jim Rain and then Doug Henderson, followed by Lauren Wilbor. Doug, please have your information ready in uh, three minutes. Jim, you're now allowed to first speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I appreciate the ability to comment. Um, I'm certainly not a 
anti-regulation person. I will start that out. I'm, I'm a, actually a former Larimer County resident. I lived in Larimer County for quite a long time. I'm a Colorado native. I just recently moved across the county line to Weld County um, along with my business. And I will tell you all quite frankly, as a business owner, one of the reasons I moved my business across the Larimer County line into Windsor was because of these types of intrusive regulations. Uh, I'm certainly not anti-regulation, but regulation has to be reasonable. Um, I view this as, as fairly unreasonable and tar targeting an industry. Um, I'll point out one area of the regulation that concerns me, and that's the noise ordinance. Uh, you have an, an, uh, a decibel level there of 50 to 55 feet as measured 25 feet from the, the edge of the pad side or the edge of the parcel where the activity is going on. So my question would be, how do you square that as fair? And I, and I believe this could open up the county to lawsuits because uh, I did a little research. I'm a 29 year financial planner. So research is my life. I'm a numbers guy. So um, CDOT did a noise abatement criteria test when they were looking at the light rail project that was published in 2011. Um, it's on cdot.gov. Their uh, noise abatement criteria is 66 decibel, 66 dBA in land use category B, residents, motels, hotels, public meeting rooms, schools, churches, libraries, hospitals, picnic areas, playgrounds, active sports areas, and parks. Um, they did some background traffic noise monitoring all through Fort Collins. Many of these readings were taken in 2005 and six, and some of them were later. The Fort Collins soccer fields, where everyone sends their children to play soccer, had a measured DBA of 69 decibels. Yet, you want to hold this industry to a, to a standard of 50 decibels? measured 25 feet away. Mountain range shadows neighborhood. Um, uh, there were other uh, big Thompson Pond State Wildlife Area in Larimer County measured 130 feet from the highway was a measured background noise level of 69 decibels. So as a, as a rational, logical person that raises the, the question in my mind of, why, why, why 50 when you look at, for example, on Timberline Road, routine average traffic levels are 65 to 66 decibels. There's a Primrose School at, at Timberline that has a, a playground for the children right outside of the west side of that building that's no less than 45 or 50 feet. And the background traffic noise there is 65 to 67 decibels all day long. Okay. Thank You're going to hold this, this industry to a to a completely un All right, like I said, I'm gonna cut people off. I gave you an extra 10 seconds there. Thank you, Jim. We understand that noise is your concern in the uh, decibel ratings. Um, we'll certainly take a, a solid look at that. Sorry to cut you off. Mr. Henderson, I am going to um, promote you really quick here um, just for this presentation and uh, then you'll be able to um, be muted again. So you're gonna to have to share both um, unmute yourself and show your video. Okay. Uh, yeah. Good evening, Matt, uh, Leslie, and others. Um, before I start, it, so Matt, let me just ask this. Do I just push this share screen button yes, at the sir. bottom? Okay, good. Um, I'm a Larimer County resident, uh, and I want to draw attention to harmful and often illegal emissions from oil and gas facilities. These emissions happen at virtually all oil and gas facilities, causing damage to people's health, ruining our air quality, and doing grave harm to our environment and climate. But these emissions have long been denied by operators and largely ignored by officials. And why? Well, one reason is that these emissions are invisible to us. Detection requires special equipment, trained people, and money, and it just hasn't happened. Colorado expects operators to self-report and be honest about emissions, but the real honest truth is that the industry lies about its emissions. Investigators with the organization Earthworks recently documented the emissions at an oil and gas facility only a few miles northeast of Fort Collins. This facility has been leaking harmful and illegal emissions for years, harming local people, air quality, and our environment. The documentation is eye-opening. 
this is, uh, oh, uh, let's see, hold on. How do I get this here? Uh, here we go. Um, so this is, this is the video and I'm just gonna show one out of two. This was shot in January of this year. Um, and uh, it was shot by Earthworks. And this is what we see with our naked eye. It looks very okay. But the person that Corey Carroll spoke about lives 1600 feet from here. And for four and a half years, he has suffered headaches and nosebleeds because of this, these emissions, which are invisible. This is caught with a special camera that can see vo uh, volatile organic compounds being emitted. Um, and this guy suffered four and a half years until Earthworks, not Larimer County or the state, finally did investigation work and caught uh, caught the emissions happening um, and reported it. They claimed they fixed it. And three months later, Earthworks went back and they were still emitting. Uh, so it isn't like they, they are really cleaning it up. Um, this is only one operator, one site. But unfortunately, it's typical of oil and gas business as usual. It's how the industry has operated for decades. Larimer County needs to get serious about stopping these harmful illegal emissions. Every oil and gas site needs monitoring adequate to identify harmful emissions. Reporting must be done in real time to be useful, not weeks or months later. Technology exists to do this and it's not canisters, which the industry prefers as we know why. Reporting also needs to be public in real time. Larimer residents and emergency responders have a right to know what is being emitted available on a public website with alert options so that people can know when a dangerous emission occurs near them and then take precautions. 25 Thank seconds. Thank you for your attention to this and the regulations. We look forward to it being addressed in further revisions to the draft regulations. Thank you, Doug. Could you unshare your screen, please, and then That's mute your video? Okay. And yeah. your... Thanks, Matt. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lauren Wilbor, followed by Dust David Austin, and then Janice Lynn. So, Lauren, you are now uh, free to speak. Yes, I had a horrible time trying to log in, so I used her address. My name is Chris Nelson. I live in Larimer County. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Okay. Uh, I find it somewhat troubling that uh, in so much public debate, there's so much hysteria. Uh, is if this, these uh, emissions are so toxic and there is so many environmental hazards in mm -hmm. Larimer County, how come there's no Superfund? How come the EPA isn't involved? How come nobody has done anything? And we're talking about all these infractions that really are not very well documented. It's humorous because we all sit in buildings and all the materials that built the buildings came from oil and gas on trucks. We're underneath the, the electric lights that are generated from the world's largest natural gas deposit in Weld County. Uh, I don't understand if you folks really want to go back to the Stone Age, and if you really want to go live in a cave, you're more than entitled to. But the only way that we can make energy at this point at a scale is with fossil fuel. I've worked as an electrician my entire life. I've worked in nuclear power plants and coal plants and, and uh, uh, even ethanol plants. Now, where on earth do you think all that's coming from? I mean, electricity is not a naturally occurring phenomenon, except in lightning. It takes acres and acres and acres of solar panels to charge a car. You work in a wind tower, it takes more power to make that wind tower than it'll ever produce. This whole fallacy of alternative energy just doesn't make it because it takes more energy to make the, the product to make energy than it does the energy it produces. And then with, the, with electricity, no matter how much energy you put in one end of the line, you've got friction and line loss all the way to the other end of the line. All the environmental people love electricity because there isn't a smokestack on the back of the car. It's just moved somewhere else. It's all shifted. I don't understand how on earth this Green New Deal is going to work 
when there is no alternative. The, the alternative energy is a declining return. There's no way you can, can make some way out of it. So good luck, you know. I think that oil and gas has provided us more freedom and opportunity than any other energy source we've ever come upon. And nobody has another one. So I think it's important that we at some point realize what the alternative is. Go back to the cave. Please wrap up your comments. I'm done. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, sir. Okay, David Austin, followed by Janice Lynn, and then Rose Lou. David, do you now have the floor? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Um, I might preface my comments by uh, the number of people that have uh, uh, been totally in favor of uh, all these regulations. I uh, wonder how many of those people are affected uh, either financially or uh, otherwise by the oil and gas in industry. I doubt very many, if any. Uh, anyway, I, I just want to make some comments regarding uh, uh, the the the, the um, decision making process. So many of uh, of these public decisions um, are made with little consideration for what the costs are versus the benefit. It's a basic exercise that is used in every kind of decision-making that, that, or should be, in every kind of decision-making uh, uh, process there is. Um, so I would hope that this concept is being used in these decisions. Um, I've done a, quite a bit of research online and I can find no health stats that specifically uh, give us number of deaths, number of hospitalizations, number of, of um, illnesses, uh, number of complaints even in Larimer County specifically. I cannot find them. And in the decisions are being made, everything I hear uh, being said tonight is anecdotal. I mean, um, this person said this, or this person is having this problem, or this person's having this problem. I cannot find any specific uh, uh, stats on the illnesses or the uh, ramifications of the oil and gas industry. Uh, you talk about the uh, air quality. Does anyone know specifically? how much of that poor air quality is coming from oil and gas as opposed to Sorry. all other sources of, of uh, air contamination. Um, I just want to also weigh in on um, the tremendous costs that uh, are going to be uh, 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 experienced as a result of this. The tax revenue, the jobs loss. We've heard a number of of um, people talk about these things tonight, and it really makes me wonder: is it truly is the cost versus benefit uh, decision making really being done here? Thank That's you. all I have to say. Thank you. All right, uh, Janice Lynn, uh, Rose Liu, and Charles Kopp. Janice, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening. Um, I've been a resident of Colorado since 1945, or 49, and Fort Collins since 1984. Over that time, I've seen the history of our split estate law, which goes back to English common law of the rights of a king to gold and our own gold and silver extraction booms which had terrible consequences for the environment and health in Colorado. 
During the many years I've been concerned about oil and gas development here, the public has wrestled with the impacts of oil and gas extraction and has, have observed that public rights to a clean, healthy environment and a livable climate has been overridden by the industry. I remember that in 2001, after the US election, then President Dick Cheney convened a closed door task force to develop US energy policy with his group of selected stakeholders, which according to Wikipedia uh, were the, and the government accounting office, were the members of, um, of the petroleum, coal, nuclear, natural gas, and electricity industry and lobbyists. None of the meetings were open to the public and no non-federal participants were involved. So-called stakeholders did not include public or nonprofit agencies concerned with health and environment. Even access to the meeting notes was restricted during many years of litig litigation. And from that time, very important regulations for clean water and air that had previously been put in place until that time took a backseat to the profits of the industry so that an imbalance was, ha has, was created and has existed ever since. When decision makers make the final decision on regulations for our county, I ask them to consider this history and that SB 181 was passed by our state legislature to try to protect some of the imbalance of needs we have lived with since the previous federal and state regulations were hijacked and that even adequate monitoring enforcement and enforcement of the now existing laws and regulations have been inadequate since. I ask them to bring much needed protections to our public health and environment as SB 181 and the past imbalances call for. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Rose Lou, followed by Charles Kopp, and then Leroy Pop. Rose, uh, you're now free to speak. Okay. Thank you. Uh, as you said, my name is Rose Lou. I want to thank you all for your hard work on this issue. I have lived in uh, Fort Collins for 30 years, and I was a student here in the mid 80s. My background is mostly in public health, water resources, and environmental science. And I was an environmental scientist at the US EPA from 1987 to 1999. I want to um, highlight three main points here. One is one that Janice just brought up, and that's the historic under-regulation of the oil and gas industry compared to any other industry that produces toxic wastes and materials. The second main point is that we really need to stop framing this as a jobs versus environment debate and frame it as a healthy jobs and healthy environment debate because really who wants to live in a place where they can't breathe the air, where there's constant threat of wildfires and drought and water resource limitations. We can have both, we are in energy transition, civilization has, trans, has transitioned over the course of many hundreds of years, energy source to another, and we are in the middle of another transition that will bring other jobs that will be healthier for people. It's not jobs versus environment, it's healthy jobs and healthy environment. Third point I wanna make is that, um, although I agree with all the specific excellent points that have been brought up by the Alarmant Alliance, I would, also urge the county to consider our contribution to the cumulative impacts on climate change and climate injustice that uh, we contribute to um, here in Colorado and the US and globally. Now, science tells us we need to decrease our greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030 to avoid catastrophic climate change and we cannot accomplish that goal which is necessary to our survival if we keep increasing permitting of fracking and oil and gas use we have to instead find ways to decrease it and transition it to sustainable energy sources 30 seconds just going back to the point about the stark under-regulation of this industry, I personally witnessed this 
in 1991 when I was giving classes to state and EPA enforcement personnel on the toxicity characteristic and the oil and gas industry was specifically exempt from the from consideration as a toxic substance, not on the grounds of health and safety or environment, but only on the grounds that it was impracticable because of the huge volume of waste from the oil and gas industry, even at that time in 1991. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, Charles Kopp, followed by Leroy, Leroy Poff, sorry, and Nadine June. So, uh, Carl, Charles, you're now allowed to speak. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Uh, uh, my comments are somewhat rhetorical, but uh, the forest is as important as the trees. Uh, I'm a resident of Fort Collins and very much in favor of stricter regulations of the oil and gas industry, as in the proposed new draft, than the lax ones in the current overly industry friendly rules. The oil and gas industry needs to be tightly regulated just like the airline industry. I'm sure most people would be unwilling to fly if that industry were loosely regulated to benefit the airline companies. And although the consequences of lax regulation of oil and gas may not be as sudden and catastrophic as a few hundred people suddenly being killed in a big airliner crash, the proven detrimental effects on public health and the environment from irresponsible oil and gas operations are very insidious with long-term and wide-ranging consequences. The county's first respons responsibility should be to protect the health of its residents and the environment, not a profit-driven industry or even certain employment. It's very discouraging to know that Larimer County received the recent F rating from the American Lung Association for its air quality, especially after I moved here from New Jersey nine years ago, a state long known for its pollution and where there's long been a huge petrochemical industry. I certainly expected to breathe better air in Colorado without having to go to remote mountainous areas. A lot of our local air is no doubt fouled by all the oil and gas operations in neighboring Well County, one of the most heavily fracked counties in the US. And the last thing Larimer needs is more loosely regulated fracking operations of our own to add insult to injury. This combined with a growing number of motor vehicles from rapid population growth can only give Larimer County an even more dubious distinction for pollution. I once heard a Greeley person regarding their local pollution comment, quote, it's the smell of money. I sure hope that mentality never comes to, to prevail here, and it should be this county administration's responsibility to make sure it doesn't. Three very essential things that any revised oil and gas regulations should include are strict setbacks of at least 2,500 feet for most operations, much better monitoring of effects on air and water quality, and responses to dangers when they occur, and a high standard of financial requirements for industry operators to ensure that they operate responsibly. Overall, higher standards are reasonable and very necessary for a county blessed with great natural resources and a lot of great people who should strive to set an example for other localities regarding public health and conservation. 30 this seconds. One, do I have a few more seconds? 30. Oh, okay. I want to comment on what the previous person said about uh, if you're not so pro fossil fuel, you should go back to a cave. <laughs> that uh, alternative energy is just hype, not viable. That goes against all. I've read about it. I mean, sure, right now we can't switch to it overnight, but we should be heading that direction because there's tremendous potential. And I remind them that fossil fuels are very finite. As a matter of fact, when I Googled it recently, uh, it said oil might be uh, uh, completely uh, exhausted in 47 years at the current rate of consumption and gas in about 50. So even if it's 500, we're going to have to face the music someday. So why wait until the 11th hour? Thank you. Sure. All right. Uh, Leroy Poff, Nadine Young, Jung, and then Gala Martinez. Uh, Leroy, you are now free to speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Very good. My name is Leroy Poff. Uh, I am a professor of biology at CSU. I've been a permanent resident of Fort Collins since 1997, and I attended graduate school here in the 1990s. Uh, I'm very interested in a livable environment in, in my community. Um, you know, fracking is a fraught industry. Uh, it's oil and gas is clearly in it's increasing, populations increasing, uh, even deniers 
accept at some psychological level the fact that climate change is occurring. And these are big problems that are not easily solved. Uh, my view is that people like yourselves who are on uh, regulatory uh, advisory boards or county commissioners have a responsibility to the public to protect the public and to do so in both the short term and the long term. So this idea of a cost benefit analysis that's based on a lot of sort of narrow short term uh, economic assumptions is really not appropriate. We need to think about longer term consequences of our actions. And that's the, so the points I want to raise here about um, my concerns about regulation of fracking. Uh, you know, the, one, one of the main frameworks I think for us to think about this is what was said earlier. It's not about what, what you say before but, but it's what you say before and less. And I believe that regulators and government should adopt the precautionary principle uh, and, and as a guiding light for how to develop regulations. There's a lot of industry sort of, uh, you know, non-critical uh, self-promoting industry boosterism around oil and gas development around fracking. And there's a, a fair amount of scientific uncertainty. So that creates an environment where there, you know, for people like you, it's a tough decision framework, decision uh, context. But there are, I think, several issues that we must consider. Uh, one, of course, is gas emissions, uh, you know, methane, volatile organics. These things are not trivial. They're not well documented. They are uh, important in affecting both air quality, you know, pollution on the front range, for which there is documentation from the fracking, uh, you know, production. It's unconscionable that we are not entering a, a mindset now of regulatory, uh, regulatory mindset where we think about the consequences of these small local actions on global climate change. That's really important. Secondly, human health, uh, obviously, uh, they've been talked about, and we should be precautionary in that. We should say, what is the least likely to cause human uh, damage given the uncertainties, okay? And not just sort of bow to the economic interests that seem to, you know, that, that sway our most of our public thinking. Thank um, you. All right, habitat destruction is something that's Thank also- you, you're right, that's all the time you have. Oh, that was... <clears throat> okay, Nadine Chung, Gayla Martinez, and Megan Thornburg. Nadine, you're free to speak. Uh, thank you. My name is Nadine Young. I live here in Larimer County, and I just want to take this time to thank the county commissioners, especially uh, Commissioner Kafalis, who pushed for enough time for us to be able to make public comments. We do appreciate that. Um, I am against the regulations, but I fear that this is just a formality that you're having this public comment because you think you've already made up your minds to effectively kill the oil and gas industry in Larimer County. I would like to address a couple of comments that other people have made. It would be great and it would be nice if we could just tell oil where it should be under the ground in only an industrial area, but let's face it, that's not a possibility. Oil is where oil is and there's nothing we can do about that. And to give away rights um, of people to mine their minerals and all of that is, is taking away our, our, our right to have, um, you know, to do with our land what we want to. We've talked about the um, pollution and the F grade that has been given to our county. And I want to, from the EPA, their website says that air pollution comes from many different sources, stationary sources such as factories, power plants and smelters, smaller sources such as dry cleaners and degreasing operations, mobile source, sources such as, gas, as cars, buses, planes, trains, and naturally occurring sources such as wind dust and volcanic eruptions. So I'm gonna tell you right now that the population in, this, in Larimer County has, has risen 42% in the past 20 years. And you can't tell me that the number of cars out there isn't creating much more pollution and much more problems in our air quality than oil and gas is. If you wanna look at what the biggest uh, EPA, the Lung Association, Bakersfield, California. Last time I checked, they didn't have any oil and gas fracking in the city. Well, if, if oil and gas fracking is what's causing our air pollution, then explain to me why Baker, 
Bakersfield, California is the biggest one out there. Um, I'd also like to address, um, you had somebody who came on a few, uh, one of the other sessions, a Sean Hackett, who talked about the, um, he was the gentleman who was at one of the work sessions. He is with the, he is the energy liaison at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. He stated that since, that since 2015, there have been 24 complaints to his office about oil and gas, 10 health related, eight non-health and six were questions. If you take that over the population in, the, in, the, in Larimer County, that is less than one one thousandth of a percent of people who live here. Other industries, we talk about wind turbines. I know somebody who worked there and sanded the blades who told me that he is in a hazmat suit from top to bottom. If that hazmat suit breaks, guess what? Nuclear protocol is what he has to deal with. So my last question to you is, what is the plan for the county commissioners to replace the lost taxes from this industry? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Gayla Martinez, followed by Megan Thornburn, and then Barrett Nottingham. Kayla, you are free to speak. Thank you. My name is Kayla Maxwell Martinez, and I live in Fort Collins. And thank you for sticking with us here. I know it's getting late. I would like to address the importance of proper zoning. In my teens, my family lived on the southern outskirts of Fort Collins. And on most summer days, I woke to hear the glorious singing of the meadowlarks out in the fields surrounding our home. Now it's a rare occurrence. <clears throat> But there's still no better way to begin my day with a sense that old right with the world than to venture out to the Maxwell Trail, named for my grandparents and great grandparents who once owned that property, and where I can listen to the liquid gold melody of a metal lark rising up into the morning sunshine. A year or so ago, I listened to a video recording of a Texas oil man who is promoting investment opportunities in oil and gas production in Larimer County. He went on and on about the presumed wealth lying beneath the surface of the land. In the background, one could hear a meadowlark singing his heart out. It seemed that both voices were making a plea for the future of Larimer County. Economic prosperity comes in many forms and through many means. With the song of a meadowlark, once the fields have been trampled by heavy equipment and industrial infrastructure cannot be replaced or replicated. Black gold may enrich a few for a short time, but the liquid gold song of the metal arcs reminds us of a kind of wealth that is meant for all, including clean air, clean water, and fertile soil. With these thoughts in mind, I would ask that oil and gas operations be limited to areas zoned for heavy industry. Mr. Sura, in his presentation, clearly described current fracking sites as heavy industry. Therefore, oil and gas operations should be allowed only in areas that are accordingly zoned. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, Megan Thornburn, followed by, I am sorry, I, I brutalize your names, er, Erhurt, Erhurt, Nottingham, and then Tim Gosar. Megan, you are now free to speak. Great, are you all able to hear me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, good evening. My name is Megan Thornburn. I am born and raised in Northern Colorado. Um, I am pleased to be the chair of our local Sierra Club, the Poudre Canyon Group. Um, the Sierra Club has a presence here, um, representing many hundreds of members in our local community. Um, our goal is to speak to some of these um, new regulations of the land use code. Um, we agree with many of the excellent points provided by other speakers this evening. Um, I have just a couple specific areas that I would like to address. 11.1.3 um, under your purpose statement, letter C, 
states that um, one of the goals is to avoid impacts to public health, safety, welfare, and the environment and wildlife resources through application of reasonable siting requirement and land use regulations. And I think a lot of the debate this evening is around the idea of what is a reasonable siting requirement um, and what are reasonable land use regulations. Um, speaking to these issues, I would like to say um, physicians for social responsibility have concluded that, quote, there is no evidence that fracking can operate without threatening public health directly or without imperiling climate stability upon which public health depends. So to that end, I would argue that there should not be any oil and gas development in Larimer County period, but in the absence of an outright ban, then setbacks and reverse setbacks should be at least 2,500 feet from anywhere where people live, work, or play. Um, and secondly, in terms of regulating land use, um, oil and gas development is an industrial activity and it should be permitted only on land that's zoned for industrial use. Uh, it has no business operating anywhere else in our county. Um, speaking to one of, one of the other points that was just made that we, we can't tell oil where it is underground, that it's, it is where it is. Um, yes, that's true, but we are again in a phase of transition and we should be transitioning away from the supremacy of oil and gas towards more um, renewable resources. And uh, my last point would be on 11.2.4 oil and gas application review criteria regarding public conservation lands. Um, these lands have been purchased to protect natural, cultural, agricultural, and scenic values. Oil and gas development would destroy the features of these lands and should not be allowed on these sites. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate everyone else's input on these important matters. Thank you, Megan. Okay, um, Eric Nottingham, Tim Gosar, and then the telephone number ending in 9565. Eric, you're now free to discuss. Hello, my name is Eric Nottingham. I'm a student at CSU and I was a student in Loveland prior to that since before kindergarten. I was a youth leader and still am a student leader of the climate movement, both in the county and state. However, tonight I'm representing myself and only myself in my comment. Any and all further fracking or oil and gas exploration whatsoever has no place in our county. Any action less than this is inadequate at best and an outright derivation of duty otherwise. The bottom line of the few should not take precedence over the many. We live in a corrupt economic and political model that maintains control over those at the bottom, even when those at the bottom consistently advocate for the preservation and respectful stewardship of the environment, specifically in this county. Our county can take the lead in our state uh, in the outright banning of further development or it can miss and harm us further. Let me be clear, if a company or occupation is reliant on the destruction of public health and public commons, they should not be in the business that they are in because we are subsidizing their profits with our lives and more importantly, the lives of those who are poorest and most at risk around the world. Please do not fail to meet this moment. There's real consequences on real people and lives are at risk. At what point do the young people of this country of, uh, of this county or of this country fight back. If we can't stop development through zoning laws and normal means, then we can shut down roads, sabotage equipment, disrupt operations, and increase the cost of drilling past the point of profit. The youth and young adult voice in all of this has been consistently denied and ignored across this country and in these specific matters at home too. CSU is not in session and few students feel as though they can make an impact through the normal electoral process, so they often check out. They face other risks as well. I myself can attest to having received multiple death threats after my very public advocacy on this issue uh, in Fort Collins and Loveland after I led multiple protests a year or so back. Uh, for these reasons, I have no doubt that I will be one of the few or only students here so far that has proven true. Regardless, my generation will have changed and we would like to work within the system, but you cannot blame us for turning away from committee meetings when this is what we can face when we engage. Our entire lives have been sculpted by policies that we have never been able to change no matter how we advocate. It has failed through all my life and for decades before I was born, especially in the realm of the climate crisis. I, as is evident by my presence here today, prefer to make public comment and fight through the legitimate electoral process, but I know many who will not stand idly by with a sign or comment while watching the, their world and future continue to be destroyed and degraded in their own backyard. My words may be controversial, but they ring true. Let me repeat. Any and all further oil and gas exploration in this county is derivation of duty on the part of our commissioners and administrators and fails to acknowledge the massive death, destruction, and displacement caused all over the world and locally uh, as a direct result of climate change um, and 
respectively, uh, look like pollution. We are literally on fire and we are literally dying. When the sky turns orange and black again, as it did last year, uh, and heat waves kills, and another heat wave kills people, the next and the next generation's riot in the street, please reflect on the choices that you've made to lead up until this point. I hope my words are not taken for audacity, but for urgency and candor. We don't have time for small actions. We need massive sweeping changes and we need them yesterday. We are far too late to be bickering over 500 feet or 2,500 feet setback, foot setbacks mm-hmm. when it, any further exploration is unex, unacceptable uh, in the face of this massive catastrophe. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for your comments. Um, the phone number ending in 9565, followed by Danita Fogel. 9565, you're allowed to speak. You'll have to unmute yourself somehow. There you go. Can you speak? We're not hearing you. Is that better? Yes, sir. We can hear you now. Okay. Thank you. This is Bill Hawkins. I couldn't get on through my iPad. Um, in a recent study, it shows Colorado has, with almost 25% of its electrical needs coming from renewable sources, yet due to its growing population, Colorado has to buy power from New Mexico and Wyoming. The windmill plant in Windsor was ready to shut down due to lack of federal sub- subsidy running out of funds. The solar panels are made with petroleum byproducts. Natural gas burns 90% cleaner than coal. By not allowing the drilling, which takes place approximately 8,000 feet below the surface, uh, by not using a petroleum, it won't help you bridge the gap until fully renewable power is available. So you're gonna cause the prices to go up. And to the lady with the Sierra Club and the gentleman with the uh, youth, Stop using your phones. Stop driving your cars. Shut off all the electricity to your vehicles and to your houses. And if you really want to do something about the environment, go to China, go to Russia, go to Africa. All those places have worse pollution than we do. You used to hear about acid rain. You don't hear anything about it anymore. Why? Because they switch from coal to natural gas. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Okay, Danita Fogel, followed by Karen Speed, and then Tim Gosar. Danita, you're now free to speak. Thank you. I kind of building, I guess, on the previous speaker. I feel that some restrictions, I mean, I have to admit, I want wouldn't want it right underneath my house, but Let's be honest, people, we're not willing to give up our cars. Who doesn't drive a car? Who doesn't heat their home with some gas? There are some that are electric, but it uses gas products to produce the electricity. And I wish there were natural reusable or re, (laughs) yeah, other resources that we could use. But we've proven that as far as I know, the only one that has consistently produced electricity of any quantity and that doesn't cost us more money to produce than it does in what we make on it is water power. We have a lot of rivers and things luckily here in northern Colorado and water hasn't been an issue. So we need to look at first fixing car usage, how much air quality, and all the other things before we start just blaming the oil and gas industry. Let's first start with ourselves. What are you willing to give up? Are you willing to give up your cars? Me for one, I'm not. I have a son in the military who oversees. And if you look, I don't wanna give any more money 
to the people in Saudi Arabia or other areas of that part of the world. We have the resources to you to produce and get what we need here in our own country. Let's have the jobs, the money, and the industry here in our own country. Let's not keep sending another resource overseas. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have Karen Speed and then Tim Gosar. Karen, you are now free to speak. Excellent. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Excellent. Uh, there are hundreds of examples that are filed at the COGCC and CDPHE of toxic contamination that has resulted in spending millions of dollars to repair the extensive damages that the oil and gas industry has caused in the state of Colorado. One most recent is in Windsor, and it's on the Larimer County side of Windsor, where an operator abandoned a well that resulted in excessive contamination. Up to now, the COGCC has spent over 1.1 million in reparation of that site. The CDPHE has spent about 18,000 in monitoring two water wells that the CDPHE actually drill themselves. This was done in anticipation of the need to measure just how much toxic leaching is headed for the Cache Laputa River and the Jodi Reservoir, which is just to the east of that well. The insurance bond that was left for this one well was for $98,000. That is less than one-tenth of what has been spent so far on this debacle. The COGCC reclamation officer for this location has told me personally that this job will be an ongoing project. I did note earlier that I believe Mr. Sura had in his notes that if it was a one to two well pad that the setback would be 200 feet. And from my memory on the mapping of that, those test wells are about 800 feet downhill from that. So I don't think 200 is probably gonna work. More famously in Windsor is a Stromberger well explosion. I live four miles west of that site and our home shook that night. This well pad has already reached past the established time. So just after flowback is over, yeah, that's a bad pollution time, but that doesn't mean horrific things like an explosion uh, cannot happen. In January of 2021, the soil and water were tested in that area of the Stromberger well pad. Mr. Stromberger now wants to sell the farm. Extensive testing by a third party, not the industry or the state was performed. That area was contaminated with PFAS, which we all know as the forever chemicals, with some samples that they tested at levels that were thousand times the acceptable range. range. Can you say Superfund site? I believe someone brought that topic up earlier. It is a Superfund site now. A large amount of fire foam, which we all know contains PFAS chemicals, was used that night as 10 fire departments responded to that event. Also half a million gallons of water were, located, were uh, dispersed on that fire. The water table is only 12 feet down as that well pad is located in a FEMA floodplain. One of the COGCC reports actually has that box checked indicating there was an impact on the groundwater that, in that event. The recommendation to remediate that area now includes Please removing the soil down. What? Please down wrap up the comments down to 10 feet, 10 feet deep, haul it to Nebraska and have it incinerated. The cost for that, $3 million. So far, extraction has declined to do this. And Thank it was- you for your comments. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Gosar, followed by Stephen Chagri. Uh, Tim, you're allowed to speak. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Great. Um, I'm Tim Gosar and I've lived in Larimer County for 26 years and I'm the coordinator for the Larimer Alliance. My dad was a self-employed and gas geologist for well over 30 years with me getting a chance to work with him when I was younger. I was supportive of the industry until I started learning about the harms caused by burning fossil fuels. And I witnessed growing up the boom and bust cycle of the industry. So no communities shouldn't be fostering and relying on it if they wanna have a vibrant and sustainable economy. I want to address a piece of oil and gas regulations pertaining to financial assurance. Bigger operators are offloading and selling their troubled assets 
to smaller operators without the financial viability to withstand many, if any, hardships or changes in the industry. Therefore, it's imperative the county requires very robust, detailed, and strong financial assurances from the operators that are doing or hoping to do business in Larimer County. Please consider the following suggestions to enhance the financial assurance part of the draft regulations. Requiring continuing proof of financial assurance is essential. Operator financials should be submitted every year with review by an accountant with industry accounting experience that reports to the county on each operator's financial viability. The accountant chosen should not have ties to the oil and gas industry and the operator should pay the yearly assessment, including the initial accounting review that should be submitted with their application. Current financial assurances filed to, with the COGC and tax returns for prior five years should be submitted by each operator. Professional liability, e and omissions. Uh, they should have professional liability coverage of minimum limits of 10 million per loss, 10 million aggregate. Please increase the financial assurance for the proposed 90,000 per well to an amount that covers remediation and or plugging and abandoning, which is closer to $180,000 per well. Part of the operator's initial financial submission for consideration of approval should be a stress test, so to speak. Operators should submit a financial overview of their viability pegged to the price of oil at various levels. How viable or not are they when prices of oil are say 20 to $30 a barrel, 30 to 40, 40 to 50 on up, and this could be done for gas as well. These viability or financial reports or results as well as the stress test information should be considered a public record that is released or posted on the county's website within 30 days. Applications and permits needed to be denied without proper financial assurances in place. All conditions of approval will survive a change of ownership and apply to the applicant's successors, including requirements of operating registration and financial assurances. I know I'm asking what might seem a lot, but this industry is going through serious convulsions with many operators filing for bankruptcy, leaving cities, counties, and states to cover the extremely expensive mess and destruction the industry leaves behind. I would note that I posted a link to a Bloomberg article about one well uh, in its lifetime spewing 30 uh, tons of methane. And I would remind the, the audience too that the Larimer County has one of the worst air qualities in the country and the largest chunk, the largest chunk is because of Well County's oil and gas regulations or oil and gas infrastructure and, and drilling. I'd say, please consider my suggestions and ask them to be considered to be put into the regulations. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, Stephen Chaudhry, you are allowed to speak at this time. Hey, Matt, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Okay. Um, since uh, health and safety seem to be at the forefront of a lot of people's minds, I'm going to address that topic first. <clears throat> Regarding setbacks, in 2018, a report authored by Chief Medical Officer Dr. Larry Walk of the Colorado Department of Public Health and Safety unequivocally stated that a 500-foot setback from oil and gas operations is more than sufficient and there is no undue risk to the community. Now, I've heard statements that hydraulic fracturing and drilling cannot be performed without adverse effects to the environment and surrounding citizenry. Well, the Environmental Protection Agency and the United States Geological Survey respectfully disagree. The reports that they released after a careful study of 132 wells led them to the conclusion that there is absolutely no undue risk to groundwater, to the surrounding environment, to the health of the surrounding community, absolutely none. So if somebody can dispute the information provided by those two agencies, I encourage you to do it. Now, I want to talk about economic impacts. Oil and gas, on average, contributes between $1 and $1.5 billion to state coffers every single year. $600 million of that <coughs> is allocated for education. And that $600 million makes up 70% of all disbursements from the school trust. So I'm curious what somebody's solution would be to fill that kind of a gaping hole in education funding, which I think we can all agree money for education is a good thing. Now, <clears throat> the only way I see you can make up that gigantic hole in funding because 70% is nothing to sneeze at, is through increased state income taxes and increased property taxes, okay? You increase property taxes to a level that middle class and the working poor can no longer afford to live here. You know what they're gonna do? They're gonna sell their homes. 
they're going to go to another state, find work in oil and gas or whatever profession they may have, and their tax dollars are going to go to that state. So at the end of the day, I think decisions, given the fact that we are all adults here, should be made based on analysis rather than emotion or someone's sense of aesthetics. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, that looks to be everybody that has raised their hand and, oh, we got one left. Uh, last call. So a couple of people, if you want to raise your hand and you haven't spoken already, please do so now. It's Kathy Kipp, you are now free to speak. Thank you. Sorry, I logged in late, so I didn't know I was supposed to raise my hand, but thank you for hearing us tonight. Really appreciate all the work that you've done on this new draft. Um, I'm Kathy Kipp. I'm a state representative representing the east side of Fort Collins and really appreciate that you're spending time on this. I just wanted to share with you some of what I've been hearing from um, my constituents who are also um, Larimer County constituents. Um, they're really concerned about air quality and the pollution, which is unfortunately really terrible here in uh, Fort Collins um, and Larimer County, some of the worst in the country. Um, issues with water quality, the health impacts of oil and drilling, and the environmental impacts as well. And people have moved to Colorado because they want to have a good quality of life. And that's not what they're... Um, seem to be experiencing right now. Um, SB 181 was a good start, but it also recognized that different areas may have different needs. We do have more data now and more information um, that we can do what's right for our communities. Um, I think that what I've been hearing is we people want to have um, bigger setbacks in water in the current drafts. They want improved monitoring of air and water quality. I know a lot of people tonight have talked about air and quality monitoring, but frankly, if you don't measure it, how do you know how bad it is, right? Um, in addition to that, I think the financial assurance, we've had just tremendous tremendous impacts in our state from people who, from oil and gas industry who have not paid for their own um, cleanup efforts right, and not clap their own wells. So we need to make sure that people um, who are doing oil and drilling are doing that. Um, I don't wanna spend a long time talking to you tonight, but I do wanna talk about the, we can build back stronger because green jobs, tourism, outdoor recreation are huge parts of Colorado's economy. And those are parts that are already huge. And if we um, allow our environment to be devastated by um, oil and gas drilling, then that will be impacted. But anyway, thank you for your time tonight. Really appreciate you taking the time to listen to everybody. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Kip. Okay, Jay Young, you are now free to speak. Okay, you got me? Yes, sir. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate that, Leslie. Um, okay, so my name is Jay Young, president of Wellington Operating Company, a local company that's been operating oil and gas fields in Larimer County for over 30 years without incident. Wellington follows the rules and has enjoyed a positive relationship with its neighbors. It pays property, severance, and ad valorem taxes. We pay royalty owners. So over 20 mineral owners were signing in the county and historically over 90% of the company's spending has been with local businesses. I asked the county for an open interactive stakeholder process. We have repeatedly contacted the planning department and your lawyer only to be told that the board will not allow them to talk to people most affected by the rules. To our knowledge, Wellington is the only company that has requested a meeting. So this will not be a burden. Writing regulations, is an interactive process that requires dialogue, not just a few letters and three minute comments. There's still time. We ask you again to ask for your share of stakeholders. The rules should allow safe and responsible energy development and they should recognize the differences between large and small operators. The county rules should recognize that Colorado has extremely stringent and comprehensive state regulations 
that were developed and adopted by specialized agencies with full-time staff who are employees specifically to regulate oil and gas and after intense public engagement. I challenge you to develop policies that work on multiple levels and serve the needs of all your constituents. In these meetings, you've heard many people demanding clean air and water, and they have a right to that. You've also heard a surprising number of people demand jobs and safe, affordable energy, and they have a right to that. We can have both a healthy economy and a healthy environment if you adopt the right policies. Instead of doing this, the draft rules run a high risk of making it infeasible to operate in Larimer County. Many of the issues targeted by the draft rules have already been solved by the COGCC and other state agencies. For example, some parties may view setbacks as a tool to protect health, but we can also protect health by regulating how facilities operate, not just where. And the state's comprehensive new rules do both. Before assuming larger setbacks are needed, please review the data and ask yourself whether the mission change rules already do the job. We strongly believe they do. The State Air Commission has promulgated six new major rules on oil and gas during the last 18 months and has two more currently underway. The state has oil and gas emissions under control. More examples, uh, the time is short. The county should not duplicate state and federal rules. Any effort to do yeah. further must include specific reasons why the state rules do not protect public health and data showing the county rule is needed. I encourage you to evaluate the current draft with an open mind free of confirmation bias. Evaluate the purpose of each provision and ask whether individual sections are in fact necessary to protect public health, safety, the environment, or wildlife resources. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> okay. Uh, okay, we are now to Chris Hochlesher. Uh Chris, you're free to speak. Thank you, Matt. I'm Chris Colclasure, outside counsel for the Wellington Operating Company. Wellington submitted a letter with detailed feedback on the draft rules. Wellington is committed to operating safely and being a good neighbor. Some aspects of the phase two rules are reasonable and we support those. Other aspects of the draft rules impose duplicative requirements without a factual basis demonstrating health, safety, or environmental benefits. Colorado has some of the most stringent oil and gas rules in the nation, if not the most stringent. Before assuming that any additional mandates are necessary, the county should identify what gaps, if any, need to be filled, and county requirements should be carefully designed to protect local resources. Staff has pointed to some jurisdictions where the rules go beyond state requirements, but has not explained why those additional rules are needed here or how they would improve public health. Nor has the county provided any data or cost estimates to support the draft rules. I will highlight three main concerns with the rules and Wellington's letter contains more. The setback provisions put a large percentage of the county off limits for development. Wellington holds just under 4,700 acres of mineral rights in a rural area. 85% of that, almost 4,000 acres, are within the setbacks of section 11.3.2. Factor in land that's not suitable for drilling because of the surface use or geology, and only seven out of 4,700 acres are available. In other words, just 0.15% of Wellington's acreage remains available for oil and gas development. Even in a rural area without dense housing or populations, the rules place significant restraints on development. And the setbacks are based on an outdated study. Tonight, the county's outside council cited a 2019 projection of potential exposures to air emissions during flowback, but this report is no longer valid because subsequent state rules reduce flowback emissions by 95%. And tens of thousands of air samples taken near Colorado wells found that air concentrations were well below the levels projected in that 2019 report. The proposal contains many unworkable air quality provisions. The proposed baseline sampling and monitoring requirements impose substantial burdens with no evaluation of the cost or benefits. There's no factual basis for choosing the 90 day and two year monitoring periods. The enforcement provisions in section 11.5 include unequal requirements that focus on shutting down operations rather than ensuring compliance. Section 1156 requires the community development director to issue a notice of violation upon, quote, reasonable cause to believe that a violation is taking place. This section is fatally flawed because the reasonable cause standard is ambiguous or undefined. <clears throat> and the rule arbitrarily, excuse me, 
arbitrarily removes the director's discretion over enforcement actions. Wellington addressed these topics and others in its initial letter, and we plan to submit more comments. We respectfully ask the county to estimate the costs and benefits of the proposed rules, reevaluate the draft, and reorient them toward necessary and reasonable provisions to protect public health based on data while encouraging safe and responsible development. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kulkisher. <clears throat> Okay, last call for anybody that hasn't spoken that would like to speak. Last call for comments. Um, I, I wanna just chime in. This is probably the last time that we're gonna have any kind of a, a public commenting session until we get to the public hearing phase um, in which you will be allowed your opportunity to come to the public hearing and voice your concerns or your comments to to the planning commission and then uh, at a second meeting to the board of county commissioners. And I wanna uh, just express, uh, I think our team's appreciation for the wide level of respect everybody's offered each other. Uh, we know this is a contentious issue and, and that, uh, uh, that everybody is, is pretty well vested into these, these discussions. So by the 28th of this month, we would ask that if you're going to have any comments that we ask that you please provide those in writing, make them very specific about word changes or wordsmithing that you might suggest. Um, you know, I like the regs or don't like the regs. We, we understand that. But if you have something that you want to see change that's meaningful, you need to get us to that, that in writing so that we can study that and make decisions on that. Um, so please do that by the 28th. Any comments received after the 28th will not be considered in the draft, the final draft but will be forwarded to the Board of County Commissioners and the Planning Commission for them to see. Um, <clears throat> so with that, I would just wrap up by saying one other thing. Um, since 1994, Larimer County was without oil and gas regulations. We didn't have oil and gas regulations until last year when the Board of County Commissioners adopted the regulations that they did. Prior to that, oil and gas merely had to operate per state level approvals. Um, so we did make some strides when we adopted those regulations. We're making some more changes, whether those are um, viewed as positive or negative are yet to be seen, but it, it's certainly something that has changed and, and we will continue to work on these up until we get a new set adopted. So with that, unless there's any of the other panelists that want to add anything, um, I will close this meeting and thank you all once again for your great participation. Have a good evening.